Hello everybody and welcome to my video on this, the Yashica, right there, Electro 35 GSN. Okay, what is this camera? But before we get started, I want to let you know that if you would like, I also have a book version of this video available on Amazon. There's a link in the video description. It has all kinds of uh, figures and graphics. It, show everything we're going to talk about here uh, and that you can toss into your camera bag or for those of you who are le learn better with books that's an option there's also a kindle ebook version so the yashica electro 35 gsn is a 35 millimeter range finder camera what does that mean first thing is it can take any 35 millimeter film within reason which is to say from 25 to 1000 iso and instead of being an slr which is to say a camera that has a single lens, a reflex mirror, and a pentaprism inside of it. This camera uses two rangefinder windows right here to help you focus the, uh, your, your photo. I do have a video, I'll link it in the description, that shows the internal workings of a different camera's rangefinder and shows the basic principle about how a rangefinder mechanically works. The Electro 35 is an automatic camera in Today's parlance, it's an aperture priority camera. Auto means aperture priority. You set the aperture, and the camera will use the light meter and the available light to calculate the best shutter speed. It uses a whole scene meter, which is in this window right here. The, light, the photo cell for the meter is right behind this window, and all of the light that's in front of the camera is read by this photo cell and uh, used to calculate the exposure. Now, that does mean that if you're taking a photo of something that is, say, very dark, you're not going to get an accurate exposure because the light reaching the film is different than the light that's in the scene. So if you have a very bright sky or something like that, that can throw off metering with this camera. With modern films, that's not so much of an issue, especially black and white, because they have a lot of very recoverable data. The camera has a leaf shutter inside of it, meaning that within the lens, multiple leaves overlap, and when you take a picture, they open and then close at the prescribed shutter speed. The leaf shutter itself has speeds of 1 500th of a second to as long as 30 seconds in the automatic mode. The only two shutter speeds you can control are 1 30th of a second when you're in flash and bulb, which is as long as you hold down the shutter, the shutter, stay, the shutter button, the shutter stays open. Those are the three modes on this camera. So 1 500th to um, 30 seconds, and then the flash sync is 1 30th of a second. So the flash sync is that setting on the lens right there. There are a lot of online resources that indicate that the flash sync speed is any shutter speed because this is a leaf shutter. However, the manual indicates that you can only use a flash properly at the flash sync speed, which is fixed at 1 30th of a second. All exposure control with flash photography has to be done with the aperture and the flashes on flash power adjustments based on your distance to the subject and the flash's guide number. That's way above and beyond the scope of this video, how to do all of that. It's just so that those of you who want to use flash, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this video, that's a little primer for some of the stuff that you'll need to know. Now let's talk about this camera's mo camera model's history. The target market was the advanced rangefinder user, and we know that because it has an automatic mode. So some of these bells and whistles like automatic exposure mode and a really good and fast lens, an f1.17 45 millimeter lens was a, a fast lens in rangefinder terms, and this is a great lens, by the way. Those are things that would have targeted this toward an advanced user. It's also built well, and the viewfinder up here has parallax correction. And basically what that means is, is as you focus the lens closer to get a subject which is nearer the uh, image, nearer the camera, so here we are as close as 2.6 feet away, what you see in the viewfinder is not going to align with what is in the frame. And with cameras, with rangefinders that don't have parallax correction, when you get down to about 10 feet away, 7 to 10 feet in this range, 
then what's in your image is going to be noticeably different than what's in your viewfinder. But with parallax correction, what this does is it shifts the framing of the viewfinder image as you focus so that you can have a correct view, uh, image that matches what's in the viewfinder. And the way that the parallax correction in this camera works is that there are four framing lines and basically they look about like this. That's not going to be visible. These four lines, okay? Four, four marks in the corners. And what happens is when you look through your viewfinder, your viewfinder expands beyond those four marks. And as you focus, what happens is that these four lines shift. Actually, I think it's about more like this from your perspective. If you're at infinity, it'll look about like that. But if you're at um, 2.6 feet or wherever that is in meters, 0.7 meters, I think, 0.8 meters, it's going to look a little bit more like this. The actual image, what you see in the viewfinder isn't going to change. Just the positioning of the framing lines will change. It's a very subtle way to go about having parallax correction. And uh, it is, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a very good approach to it because it's not distracting in the, the focusing and imaging comp, image composition process. These were made by Yashica in Hong Kong from 1973 until 1977. It was preceded by the DS and GT. Is that correct? No, it should be the GS and GT. Oops. And it was followed by nothing directly in terms of there were no electro cameras made after this. By the time 1973, 77 rather, rolled around, it was pretty obvious that the days of the rangefinder were numbered and they were falling out of favor for very quickly in, uh, in for the people preferring SLRs or easier to use po point and shoot cameras. So um, the rangefinder pretty much was extinct by the end of the 70s. Now, if you have your electro, your 35 GSN, uh, we're, as we do, we're going to go over all of the features on the camera. And we're going to start right up here on the top. Over here on this side, this is the film rewind knob and lever. The lever pulls out, out like this so you can rewind the film when you're done with it. This is your model number, flash hot shoe, your exposure indicator. This is to indicate that your shutter speed is too slow. So I think it's 1 30th of a second and slower shutter speeds make this illuminate. If this is on, you can still take a photo, but you need to have your camera on a tripod or other surface. The red light down here over is what is the camera when the camera tells you this it means that you need a shutter speed faster than 1 500th which this camera can't deliver you might notice there's an arrow here and an arrow here those arrows correspond with the direction you have to turn the aperture ring in order to turn that light off so if you're getting the red light that's over and you're at f17 then you can turn the aperture ring the direction of the arrow maybe by the time you're at f56 that light goes off if you're at f5.6 here and you're getting this slow indicator and you don't have a tripod, you need to handhold, well now you turn it in the direction of this arrow, say maybe f2, and now that light goes off and you can take your photo. If no lights are on, you're good to go. This is the film speed selection dial. This is the shutter button right here. Oh, you can see, got one of the lights on. Anyway, uh, there's a little lock, uh, collar around it when the red index right here points towards the L, that means your shutter button is locked and you can't push it. When the red index is over here toward the film speed dial, you can push the shutter button. Film advance lever, which also rearms the shutter. Here we have the frame count window. And you might notice throughout this video that frame counter isn't gonna change. There's something with this camera where uh, the the frame count automatically resets every time it goes past start. And then over here, there's a little green window where when you push the battery check button, there it is, that illuminates to let you know that the battery is good. On the front of the camera, we have a few things. The electron symbol, the Ashika logo, the GSN tag to indicate which, which uh, entry in the Electro 35 series this is, your light meter window right up here, and your rangefinder windows. 
This is your focusing window, and this is your viewfinder window. We'll talk a little bit more about how this works in terms of what you're, you see in the viewfinder later in the video. On the camera sides, we have the PC port up here. You can connect the flash here as well as to the hot shoe. And then each side has a strap lug. Here on the camera's back, we have the viewfinder window. This is what you would look through to compose your image. The battery check button and the serial number. The serial number is just a unique identifier for your camera to indicate that it's unique. All cameras back, well, still now, all cameras come with, almost all cameras come with a serial number. On the camera's bottom, what we've got here are the battery chamber and the tripod socket. And then here we've got the film rewind release button. So this is where the battery is kept. This is where you would att attach a tripod. And this is what you would push down prior to rewinding the film. To get inside of the camera, all you've got to do is lift up on the film rewind button or film rewind knob rather, and the back should pop open very easily. In here we have the film cassette chamber. In just a minute we'll see how to load film here. This is the shutter area where the image will actually be projected, so the size of this opening is the size of your negative. These four silver rails are the film guide rails. These two on the top and bottom prevent the film from moving up and down as it travels, and these two on the inside here, which if you feel on your camera are a little bit recessed compared to the outside ones, is what uh, your film sprocket holes rest on. So when you load your film, the sprocket holes are the holes on the top and bottom of the film there. This is the film uh, tension sprocket. This helps to pull the film smoothly and evenly through the camera when you advance the shutter. This is the film take-up spool where you'll attach the film leader to help it uh, be taken up through the camera. Over here, we have the film pressure plate. This is the thing that sandwiches up against those inner silver guide rails. And then here we have a little cassette spring that keeps the film cassette properly aligned in the camera so that the film will advance and rewind correctly. So the next thing that we're going to look at is what's on top of the lens right here. And later in the video, we're going to talk about how to read all of these markings and what they do. But first up, this little indicator here tells you which mode you're set in. That's flash, auto is aperture priority, and B is bulb. Just going to leave it here for now. This next ring right here is your aperture control ring. So in automatic mode, like this, when you adjust the aperture, the camera is going to use the light that's in front of the camera and your film speed to calculate a correct shutter speed. So if we set this to f16, it would help if I advanced it. It's not enough light to handhold the camera. If we pull this back to f17, we're, we're flirting with 1 500th of a second right there. We put it somewhere in the middle. There we go, proper exposure. On the aperture ring, we have three symbols. That little black window thing is to indicate that this is a good aperture to use indoors. This cloud is a symbol that indicates that that's good for shade. And down here we have a sun, which indicates that these settings are good for full sun. Behind the aperture ring, we have, uh, oh, before we get that far, we have the self-timer. This is the self-timer lever right here. Now, as a general rule, I often don't advise using the self-timer on old leaf shutter lenses because if it breaks, they can, that can jam the lens and brick it. But I've tested this one a couple of times and I know that it works pretty reliably. So when you arm the shutter, it just counts down like this. And then when it reaches the end, the leaf shutter is triggered. These are our focusing scales. We'll talk about how to read those later in the video. And the last thing on the lens is the focus ring right here. And this is what you would use to focus the image from infinity, which is anything that's about 400 times the focal length of the lens and further to as close as the lens can focus, which is 0 0.8 meters or 2.6 feet. On the side of the focus ring, there are two plastic bu bumps right here, and these are to help you focus. So when you hold the camera and you go to take a picture, you can focus very easily by putting your thumb on one and your index finger on the other, and that makes this camera very easy and quick to focus. 
So before we can do anything else with this camera, it requires a battery. If you don't have a battery, then the automatic exposure mode will always fire the shutter at 1 500th of a second, and the, but I do believe that flash and bulb will still work at their correct shutter speeds. We'll check that out in a second. To do that, the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna set the aperture to 1 7 so we have a nice big opening, and we're gonna hit the flash button. So you can see what that looked like as I uh, triggered the flash button at the flash or the shutter button at the flash setting for bulb. There we go. So that's looking pretty good like it actually works. Now let's take the battery out and see if both of those shutter speeds still work properly. I actually don't know the answer to this. So we'll go back to the flash sync speed. That looked pretty darn close to the same. We'll try that again, make sure. Yeah, that we'll call that 1 30th of a second. And then bulb, uh, that looked like about 1 30th as well. Let's see what it does in auto, just to be sure. They might actually all be firing at 1 500th. It's a little bit hard to tell. At any rate, interesting to know that bulb does not work with, uh, without a battery. I did not know that. This is what a good and clean battery chamber looks like. So your battery chamber should look like that, free of white or green powder. The Electro 35 GSN and the other Electros before it used a mercury battery, and it was a 5.6 volt battery that was this size. It was a decent sized battery. There's no direct replacement for it anymore. However, an LR44 or PX28 battery will work. And the way that this, so this is an adapter for it. The way that the adapter works is that this is the positive terminal and this is the negative. So we're gonna find the positive terminal on the battery and it just slides in like that. And then the adapter and battery slide into the camera that way. So that's a really easy way to do it. You can get an adapter for it. Uh, I honestly only got the adapter for the book and this video because there's another even easier way to do it. And the PX28, by the way, is six volts. It's a little bit more voltage than the camera was designed for, but the camera handles it just fine and does not have any issues with the over voltage affecting metering. Metering is correct. So the other, and the other way that we're gonna do this is a little bit cheaper and easier, and you can probably do it right now. Just grab your battery, drop it in with a positive terminal towards the base. Then we're gonna grab a piece of tin foil which this is just a little bit smaller than a poker card. I'm just gonna wad that up and jam it into the battery compartment. And we're gonna turn this the up opposite direction until it's aligned well. There we go. And now we're gonna screw the battery cap back in. This should screw in very easily. If it's fighting, then you wanna back it out and try again. You don't wanna cross thread this because cross threading it can damage the battery cap or the base plate. It's kind of a pain to get those re replaced. You can do it, but it's better not to replace something if you don't have to. So let's see if that worked. Oh, hey, that did. <laughs> I, I was confident. Okay, so the aluminum foil, the way that this works, whether you're talking about using aluminum foil or an adapter, is that you saw when we looked inside of the camera that there was that um, spring, right? Way down inside the, um, the body of the camera. That is one part of the electrical circuit, and the other part of the electrical circuit is, I think, this silver ring right here. So basically what you're trying to do is connect that silver ring that's just inside of the battery chamber to the battery, and normally the battery cap does that. With the tin foil, uh, it either does it directly or it runs through the battery cap, depending on how well or not well it's wadded up. And um, so that's why the tin foil works. And it's a good and cheap solution the, which, that is probably available in your kitchen right now. Now that we've got a battery in, we're pretty close to being able to start taking photos. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put in the, we're gonna load film, okay? So 35 millimeter film, anything from 25 to 1000 ISO. 
ASA and ISO are the same, although this camera doesn't mark the film speeds with ASA. We're going to put the film in. We're going to push the film rewind knob down until it's flush with the top of the camera and pull out a leader. Feed the leader into the take-up spool. And that's a really quick way to do it. Once you have the leader in there, just rest your finger over the sprocket holes and advance the film like this. And having your finger resting there will keep the sprockets pushing down into the, uh, the sprocket holes pushing onto the sprocket so you can take up the film. Now, if you remember when we looked inside of the camera earlier, I said the outside uh, guide rails keep the film from moving up and down. And you can see that that film's not really going to go a whole lot of places up and down anyway. And that the sprocket holes rest on the inner guide rails so that the film can be sandwiched up against the film pressure plate here. And that'll, that means that when the film is flat like this, that the lens focuses light properly. So with the film like that, we're going to close the back. Next thing we're going to do is pull, is turn this the direction of the arrow until we feel some resistance. That'll take any slack out of the film. Now, if you watch, this film is really old and it's just going just gonna to pull back in the other direction. Anyway, that's just fine. We'll let it be that way. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take three photos. Now I'm going to press the shutter button and advance the film. And if you notice, and I've got the lever out here to make it a little bit easier to see. If you notice that the film rewind knob turns in the direction opposite the arrow as you advance the film, when that happens or when the knob turns, that means that the film is being taken up correctly. So we're going to advance until we get to the, the frame, frame number one. Now on this camera, you'll notice if you can see, if you have a big enough monitor, that that's still on start. And as I mentioned, that's because of a mechanical issue with this camera. Next thing we're going to do is make sure that the film speed is set correctly. We have 400 ISO film in. It's load, set to 400. That's perfect. But if we had 200 ISO film in, we could set this to 200. I'm going to show you something really neat about this camera while we're here. All right, so if we look in the film meter window right there, you can see that it's a triangle shape, right? You might be noticing that as I adjust the film speed, that triangle opens and closes. There we go, just like that. So at 1000 ISO, it lets in a ton of light. And at 25 ISO, it lets in very little. So the, the film speed control dial, all that that's doing to adjust the exposure is increasing or decreasing the amount of light that reaches the photo cell in the camera's meter. So one thing to bear in mind about film, if you're new to it, is that it's one and done. Film can be used a single time to record an image, and it can record a, a properly exposed image in a controlled manner with a proper aperture and shutter speed, or it can record all of the light that reaches it in an uncontrolled manner like this. So if you open up the back of your camera while you are taking photos, all of the film, which is outside of the cassette, so like everything from here on, would be erased. So if you got to the end of your roll, let's say, and opened up the back of your camera, you would erase all of your photos. If you take your film out before you take any photos with it, it will erase all of the photos you could take. The way that film works is there are there is a, 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 a photo emulsion on the other side, and when photons reach it, it's used. It cannot be used a second time. But I'm, I've opened up the camera here to show you how the film moves inside of the camera. So we'll notice our little smiley face right here, okay? And when you hit the shutter button and advance the film, the film moves through the back of the camera. So you, you take a photo and then you advance the film and then the film moves past the area where the photo is recorded. And the reason that the film rewind knob here spins whenever you take a photo is because there's a mechanical connection from the take-up spool to the film cassette right here. Okay, so you've gone through your whole day, you've taken all of your film, 
You still want to keep your camera closed, but I'm going to show you what happens when you push the film rewind button there on the bottom and you rewind the film. My finger is going to do the job of the spring on the back of the camera right here. So when you rewind the film, it just rewinds the film back through the camera exactly the opposite way. There we go. Normally I've been rewinding this all the way in, but this, this leader is so shot that it's not really working anymore to pull it out. So, but in real life, what you would want to do is, uh, preferably, most people will rewind the leader all the way into the film cassette. And that is a good reminder not to reuse the film and not to accidentally get double exposures. The other thing you can do, and a lot of people do this as well, is have a Sharpie with you and write some notes on the film leader here. You can see that you do get a bit of a leader when you load the film, so you have a little bit of space to write some notes about what your shoot was. If you're developing your own film for something like a photo class, that can be a really helpful way to keep some uh, reminders of the film when you go to develop it. You could leave a note to yourself about which specific developer you want to use, or if you pulled or pushed the film, things like that. And uh, of course, cassettes that also aren't all black, you can write some of that information on the cassette. All right, next thing we're going to talk about is how to use a flash. The 35 GSN has two ways to connect a flash, at the hot shoe right here and at the PC socket right here. So if you have a flash that is off of the camera, some, some flashes will come with a cable that looks kind of like this and it just plugs right into the PC socket like that. Like, come on, not while I'm recording, man. Cooperate. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Cooperated. Just like that. Okay. That is how that works. When you use the flash in this camera, make sure that you're set to the flash setting to uh, have a proper flash exposure. The other way you can connect a flash, of course, is by using any old standard flash and plugging it into the hot shoe just like this. Now this camera can only take X flashes. X flashes look like this. They have a bulb that can be reused over and over and over again. If you have to change the bulb each time you use it, you have either an FP or an M flash. Well, they're all FPs, but you're either using one that has an FP bulb or an M bulb, and um, those will not work with this camera. Only X flashes will work. Now. There are some notes about using a flash. The first one is going to be that the worst possible place to put a flash is on top of the camera like this, okay? Because when you, you fire the flash, the light will leave the flash. It will re reach your subjects. It will bounce off of your subjects and back to your lens. You're getting a flat wall of photons each way. It's going to make your subjects look flat and waxy, and if you have color film, it will almost certainly cause them to have glowing red eyes. None of that is flattering. So, there are a couple of things you can do to mitigate that. The first one is gonna be pretty simple. If you have an articulating flash, well, this is a tilting flash like this, right? So you can tilt the flash upward toward the ceiling and bounce the light off of the ceiling. But why? If you think about how we see people outside, we're underneath the sun, indoors, we're underneath overhead lights, or even outside at night, we're under street lights, for instance. People's brains are hardwired to see someone who's lit from above as being lit in a normal and flattering manner. So if you put your flash on your camera and you point it upward and bounce the light off of the ceiling, you're going to immediately set up your subject to be more well lit. Some flashes, in addition to having a tilting head, also have an articulating head or swiveling. Fully articulating means tilting and swiveling. So you, you can point it at the wall. You could point it at the corner where the ceiling meets the wall. Um, all kinds of things like that. Okay, but what if you only have a basic flash that's locked in position like this? You can't adjust the head at all. One thing you can do is get what's called a flash bar, which just looks like this. It's a little piece of metal with two uh, quarter 20 screws on it and a tripod mount. One screw gets screwed into the bottom of the camera, and the other one you would need a hot shoe adapter with a quarter 20 mount. You would then connect the flash to that, and those have a little cable that would go to the PC port up here, and then you can short shoot in portrait mode and bounce your flash off the ceiling this way by rotating the whole flash. Okay, this is 
if you just shot like this, this is also a pretty terrible way to have a flash mounted, just so you know. But if you're shooting in landscape, you could at least bounce it off of the wall. So there are some options for the cost of like a $5 adapter and a $5 to $10 flash bar that can, that can make your flash work much better. Now, one other note on using the flash, we're gonna go a little bit into this. I do have a video on how to use the, um, how to calculate flash guide numbers. It's an older video, but I'll put a link to it in the video description. Because your shutter is fixed at 1 30th of a second when you are in flash mode, you have two ways to control your flash. With the aperture, right here, and with the manual controls on the back of the flash right here. So you can adjust. This one actually doesn't have a full set of manual controls, I don't think. Um, no, it doesn't. Many flashes, even new ones you could buy today, will have power adjusters. So you could in, so you could set them to their normal power or you could decrease the power if you wanted to. Or they also have um, extenders on the front of them for telephoto or wide angle lenses that will adjust the power as well. So when you use a flash with this camera, you need to know the flash's guide number, the speed of your film, and that guide number, by the way, is usually provided for 100 ISO film. If you're using something slower or faster, you have to adjust the guide number accordingly. And then you also need to know the distance to your subject. So with those three data points, you can then calculate how much power you need based on your selected aperture, or if your flash only has one power, which aperture you need to select to have a proper exposure. Whole science into and of itself, well, above and beyond the scope of this video, how to do it, but those are the things you need to know to use a flash effectively with this camera. Okay, next thing we're gonna talk about so we're going to come back here to my crudely drawn viewfinder and we're going to talk about how to focus this camera. Okay, When you look through the viewfinder, in addition to the four framing lines, you're also going to see a little diamond in the middle, probably a little bit smaller than that. Okay, What this diamond is going to have is it's going to have a secondary image in it. So if you're focusing, like let's say you've got the edge of a building right here, okay? You've got your ed the edge of your building, and then if you are focused correctly, your image is going to line up right here. If you are focused incorrectly, the edge of that building is going to be over here or maybe a little bit out of the frame, depending on how far off your focus is. As you adjust the focus on your lens, the edge of that building is going to move closer and closer and closer until it overlaps the edge of the building right here. The same is true if you're taking a picture of a person they, and you have the corner of their eyes right here. So the way to use this when you're taking a photo is however you want to frame it. Let's say that you want to have it framed so that you've got a person, your, your friend's face is over here, okay? And then there's like a, a forest or whatever over here. But if you just put your, your viewfinder here, how are you going to know when your friend's in focus? When you look through the viewfinder, everything is always in focus. So what you have to do is slide your viewfinder over so that your viewfinder is on your friend's dominant eye, which is the one that's closer to the camera. You focus on your friend's dominant eye until the eyes overlap in the diamond, and then you recompose your image to the way that you want it to be. Don't adjust the focus at all once you've achieved focus over here. Take the picture. That's how you're going to focus with this camera and adjust your framing so that you have a proper image. While we're looking through the viewfinder of the camera, or at least my very crudely drawn mock-up of it, what you might notice is that at the top of the viewfinder, there are some arrows. And they don't always light up. And one of them's red and one of them's orange, and I'm blanking on which one is which. Let me double check. Okay, the orange one is on the right. I thought that was the case, but I wasn't, wasn't certain. Okay, orange and red. Now, when these light up, it's the exact same as when the lights on top of your camera light up. So if you have your orange light on top of your camera lit up, the orange light inside of the viewfinder is also going to be lit up. Got this one right here, indicating that we need to turn the aperture in the direction of the arrow to turn that light off. 
And likewise, if you have, and likewise, if you have the red one lit up, can I get it lit up? Yes, there we go. Then the red light inside the viewfinder will also be illuminated and you'll have to turn the aperture ring until that red light turns off. So the information that's up here is also inside of your viewfinder at the top. Okay, <laughs> all right, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how to use some of the markings on top of your lens, all right? So we've pretty much taken care of the mode and the aperture already. So what's left to talk about, and the reason we're this close up, is how to use the focusing indicators, okay? So there are two things that you need to know about how to focus. We've talked about how to use the rangefinder, but you also need to know how this lens focusing ring works. As you move the focusing ring out, the number that aligns with the red indicator is the point of your focus, okay? What are those numbers around it? Going from 16 to 16, those are your focusing scales. So let's set this lens aperture here to f16. Let's set the infinity mark over here to this line, which lines up with 16. Let's erase that pencil mark that I put on by accident. Okay, so we've got infinity lined up with 16. This other 16 over here corresponds with the aperture 16. And that it means that everything from two meters to infinity will be in focus at F16. Okay, but, but I don't wanna use F16. I actually only wanna use F8. Everything from just shy of three meters, let's call it 2.75, out to about six meters will be in focus. Beyond six meters and closer than 2.75-ish, will not be in proper focus at this focus point. Okay, but I'm gonna take a really close up portrait of someone and I'm gonna have them three feet or 0 0.9 meters away from me. And I wanna have just, they're, they're gonna be angled with their one shoulder closer to me and their other shoulder further away. So I need a depth of field of let's call that about three feet. And then there's a distant background behind them that can be nice and blurry. So what we need to do is figure out what aperture on here is gonna give us that depth of field. So three feet's about a meter. We're not gonna to get too much closer than 0 0.8 meters, so that's gonna be a little bit tricky. But to go out to 1.9, oh, we actually can't reach two meters. All right, so if we have our friend focus stand a little bit differently, we can now turn their, their shoulder profile like this, and now they're only maybe a quarter meter in uh, deep, right? we still need to be right around F16 because at F16 at, three, at 0 0.9 meters, we're around 0 0.78 meters to one point, just shy of 1.2 meters that's gonna be in focus. Your background will not be super soft and blurry, but it will be, uh, everything in that range will be sharp and in focus. But, we really do want to have a very soft and smooth background for this portrait, so we're going to make a compromise. We're only going to have their face be in focus. Now for that, if we set it at f4, we know everything from about 0 0.87 to about 0 0.95 meters is going to be in focus. That gives us a depth of field of about 7 inches for those of us in the US, maybe a little bit less. That's enough to get a person's face in focus and still have a very nice and pleasing out of focus background. So that's how you're gonna use the focusing scales on the rangefinder camera. You find your focus point, you find the lines that correspond with your aperture, and then you figure out what your depth of field is gonna be. And that's a really good way to calculate very precise depths of field for things like up-close portraits. All right, having gone over everything you need to know about how to use this camera so far, we're gonna talk about how to take a photo. Now, the basic premise is that you're gonna get most of your settings set up, so all you really need to do prior to taking your photo is adjust your aperture and your focus, okay? And compose your image through the viewfinder. The very complex act of taking a photo is done this way, by pressing the shutter button. That's all there is to it. Once you have your settings dialed in, you're just gonna take a photo and then advance the film, okay? What about double exposures? Oh, that's a good question. Can you do them with this camera? I mean, it's automatic. Yeah, you can. So we're gonna go through the mechanics of taking a double exposure first so you see how to do it. First thing you wanna do is take any slack out of the film that it, that's in there, okay? Next, you're gonna make sure that we're ready to go with our first, first frame. 
So we're going to take our first photo. We're going to hold the film rewind button here. I'll turn this around so you can see it being done as you would actually hold the camera, okay? We're going to hold, press and hold the film rewind release button on the bottom. And while we are holding both of those things, we're going to advance the film advance lever and then let go just like that. Now we take our second photo, okay? That's the mechanics of taking a double exposure. The, uh, oh, the, the last thing is, it's always advisable to take a dead frame with your, after you finish. And with this camera, you set the shutter speed to flash, the aperture to 16, you put a lens cap on, and then you take your dead frame and advance the film. And the reason you do that is because when you take a double exposure, you often misalign the gearing in the camera. And so when you start to advance the film, it might not be taken up instantly. And that means the double exposure frame will only advance part way instead of all of the way out of the image taking area. So you take the dead frame so that your, the image after your double exposure doesn't partly overlap your double exposure and ruin both photos, okay? The, the, the dead frame ensures that you're on uh, fresh media when you go to take your next photo. So that's the mechanics of it. But what about the science of it? The, the, the Electro 35 is set up so that it will always give you a proper exposure. The film is designed to only get the amount of light that comes through the, the lens with a proper exposure. So if you, if you hit film with twice as much light as it's designed to have, you're gonna end up with a negative that's called thick, dense, or dark. Those are three words that mean the same thing. The film had too many photons reach it. And in the dark room, you're going to have low contrast with long print times. And if you digitize, you're going to have low contrast with lots of digital noise. So to get a double exposure that is properly exposed, each of the two exposures needs half as much light. And we're gonna do that with the, with the film speed dial up here. 400 to 200 to 800, each one of these orange numbers is a full stop. So every time you half or double the number, you're either halving or doubling the amount of light. So 400 to 800, 800 film is faster, which means it needs less light. In fact, it needs half as much light as 400. 200 ISO film is twice as, is slower than 400. It needs twice as much light. So if you were at f5.6 and at 400 ISO, you had a 1 1 25th of a second shutter speed, 1 60th, 1 2 50th. That's how those numbers relate. So if we're gonna do a double exposure and we have 400 ISO film, we need half as much light we're going to adjust the film speed dial over to 800 for our double exposure frame. This will cut the amount of light in half. And because the auto exposure is, because the exposure is automatic, you don't even have to take the two frames right at the same time. You can take one outside, one inside, one right now, one in six hours, just as long as you compensate with the, with the film speed setting, you're gonna be in good shape. Just remember after you're, you're done with your double exposure, to set the ISO at the correct number. Otherwise, all of the rest of your film will end up being thin, which means it didn't require, it didn't receive enough light, and you're gonna have different kinds of problems, whether you print it in the dark room or digitize it later. Some tips for using the Yashica Electro 35 GSN. So this is a stunning, stunning camera. Um, if you're curious about the types of images that this can take, I have a round glass review video, I'll link in the description on the lens from this camera that I stripped off of a broken uh, GSN body. And it's an amazing, amazing lens. So uh, if you find a broken GSN, by all means, take the lens off of it and cobble together an adapter for your mirrorless camera. It will not work on any mirrored SLR, but um, you could put it onto a mirrorless camera without too much difficulty and uh, you can get some really stunning photos. So one thing, because the shutter speed on this is limited to 1 500th of a second, this camera works best with medium and slow speed films such as 100 ISO and or 50 ISO or slower. Uh, and that's for full sun. Indoors, 
Using something like a T-Max or Delta 3200 set to 1000 ISO can also work on this camera. So the only time you really want to use a fast film, say faster than 400, is going to be when you're inside. And in full sun, realistically, anything faster than 100 is too fast. Focus with this camera is precise enough to use the lens wide open. These had very well calibrated rangefinders, and if you're shooting at f1.7, you can expect to get good focus with and accurate focus with this camera, unless of course you move while you're taking the photo. The pad of death issue is the primary mechanical problem with this camera. If your pad fails, there will be a uh, there there will not be a thunk sound after the shutter fires. And the repair for that should be done by a professional, as it requires some significant disassembly of the camera. So let's let's see if I can show you what the shutter sounds like. You might have heard that that shutter has two sounds, the, 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 the triggering. The, the pad of death sound is that one of those sounds isn't there, and when you advance the film you only have a ratcheting sound. No sort of quiet secondary sound behind it. So if you have the pad of death, your camera will not properly work after you advance the film, you'll get some issues, especially as it relates to the metering circuit. Uh, these cameras also work very well with both color and black and white film, but black and white will truly bring out the most in this lens because black and white film is sharper and generally higher contrast than color. So you can absolutely use black and white color negative and, and color slide film in this camera, but when you use black and white, the results from this, this lens will be absolutely staggering. Especially if you're using black and white film and say like a light yellow filter on the front of it. Oh, really nice. Um, also, if you don't have a battery, like I said, the camera will only work at 1 500th of a second and um, bulb and, and, and flash modes will not function correctly. So definitely make sure you have a battery. If you're missing the battery cap, realistically you can use the, the aluminum foil trick and then just tape over it and probably make a good enough connection to buy yourself some time until you buy a new battery cap. Some things not to do with your camera. Don't store the camera with the shutter ready to fire. So whenever you're done for the day, always trigger the shutter. These are mechanical shutters, so when you advance the film, it puts tension on springs inside of these, and as these age, the springs get old and weak, and fatigued springs can, can lose their ability to time the shutter correctly or break and brick your shutter. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car. Heat damage can cause lubricating oils to get very thin and get to places they shouldn't be. Then when they get back to the proper viscosity, they get onto things they shouldn't be, and then things don't work correctly. That's especially true with leaf shutter lenses if oil gets onto the leaf shutters. Also, extreme cold can cause those same lubricating oils to get thick and gummy, which can cause them to just make everything sluggish and not work correctly. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box unless you have a good and rechargeable desiccant pack that you keep recharged often. And the reason for that is that plastic is moisture permeable. So even if you have a perfectly dry environment when you start with this inside of a plastic bag or box, moisture will make its way in. Don't let your camera get wet. It's not weather sealed, and water inside of this will absolutely short out or ruin or corrode the electronics, so definitely don't let it get, get wet. Uh, I wouldn't even take one of these out and drizzle, quite honestly, because they, they don't have that weather sealing to protect them even from a mi minor rain. If they get if you're out in a drizzle or minor rain and it gets wet, just make sure you keep you dry it off very quickly. And the last thing to remember is that your Yashica Electro 35 GSN is a precision tool that should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you.